This is the section 2.3, Calculating Limits Using the Limit Laws. Our first content objective, Objective 1, is to find limits algebraically using limit laws and direct substitution. By the time you're done with this objective, you should be able to explain why finding a limit using direct substitution on a continuous function works. So before we can explore this objective, we need to have a handle on what these limit laws are that we're expected to use. So there are 11 of them, and at first glance it gets a little overwhelming because there's just so much ink on the page. But the good news is, is that each of these limit statements are quite intuitive. They behave exactly like we would hope they would, they would behave. So for example, let's say we look at number one. Number one says, if I want to compute the limit as x approaches a from both sides on this function that has been written as f plus g, then I can compute that by looking at the limits of f and g separately and then adding them together. So what that really means for us is that this limit can be distributed over addition. Same thing over here, that limit can be distributed over subtraction. So we can do what we want with the functions first and then compute the limit or we can compute the limits separately and then perform the operations. So if you read through the rest of these, those are all kind of working the same way. The general rule of thumb is if you can do it with the functions and then compute the limit, you'll get the same result as if you compute the limits of the individual functions first and then perform the operation. So the only thing to keep in mind on number five especially is that you cannot compute the limit of a quotient of functions unless that bottom limit never equals zero. So let's look at this first example one. With example one we are given some explicit limits for three different functions and then based on those we want to do new things with functions and find limits. So I'm going to write out the first couple of them using those limit laws and then for the next ones I will skip this intermediate step because my hope is is that eventually this will feel very intuitive for you and you will just automatically go to the final answer. So on a part A here we can distribute that limit notation over the addition and see that the limit of f plus h as x approaches a will be the same as the limit of f as x approaches a plus the limit of h as x approaches a. Now this piece we know because it was given to us as negative 3 and this one we know as well because it was given to us as 8. So I can put those together and end up with a 5. Same thing on this one. This limit is going to behave just like we hope it would, so instead of squaring the function and then computing the limit, we can compute the limit of the function and then square the result and get the same thing. So this piece we know is negative 3 and then we're going to square it to get 9. So I'm now going to skip this intermediate step and just go directly to the answer. This says I can compute the limit of h, which is 8, and then take the square root. Next one says I can double the limit of f and then divide by the limit of h minus the limit of f. So we end up with a negative 6 over 11. Final one, I can double the limit of f and then divide by the limit of g. Now here's where we run into that problem we saw in limit law number five. We're not allowed to divide by zero, so this particular limit does not exist. This ne next example deals with a graphical representation of the same limit law applications. So here we want to use the limit laws and the graphs to evaluate the limits. So we know from what we just did in example one that this will be the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f plus 5 times the limit as x approaches negative 2 on g. So to compute these limits, we're going to backtrack to what we did earlier in the chapter, and we're trying to approach negative 2 for the x value from both sides. So I'm going to locate negative 2, I'll move to the right and to the left, and up to the curve of f, which is the red one. Then I will travel along those curves 
toward an x value of negative 2 and I look to see what that y coordinate is and it is 1. Then I'm going to add 5 times that limit as I approach that same x value of negative 2 on the graph of g. Notice if I move from the right and from the left I'm approaching that same y value of negative 1. So put those two together I have a 1 minus 5 gives me a negative 4. If I look at the next one, I'm looking at the limit of f as x approaches 2 from both sides. So again, here's my graph of f, the red one. I locate the 2, move up to the graph, left and right, and then move toward 2 from both directions. We can see that the y value is approaching 2, and then I repeat that with the g. So to the left and right of 2 on the graph of g, move toward 2, and we see that our limit is going to be a y coordinate of 0. If I move to the final one, I'm still approaching that 2 on both f and g, so I can put the 0 limit in for g and the 2 limit in for f and see that that quotient will be 0. So to help us with the analytical variation, because so far we've had the limits given to us or we've been able to read the limits off the graph, what happens if we are given an analytic function and we still have to compute limits? Well, we have this nice property called the direct substitution property, and what it tells us is that f is a if f is a polynomial or a rational function, as long as a is in the domain of a, then the two-sided limit as x approaches a on that f of x is going to equal the output of the function that is assigned to f. So let's look graphically at something to kind of explain why this is the case. Let's say I have some random polynomial. Polynomials, if you recall, can be drawn without picking up your pencil. We just get a bunch of humps and turns or whatever you want to call, whatever vocabulary you use to describe these things. But we start and we keep going and we never pick up our pencil. So what this tells us is if I pick any value of a, and I move to the right, and I move to the left, and hop up on the curve, and then move along the curve from both sides, then the y-coordinate that I'm getting close to is the same as the actual output of the function. The same thing holds true if we move to a rational expression. So rational functions, um, you only pick up your pencil if you have an asymptote or a hole. So we could have something along these lines and something doing this, let's say. So here's an example of a rational function. And as long as we are in the domain, that means we're not trying to find an output on this asymptote, nor are we trying to find an output on the whole. As long as we are in the domain, so I could, for example, let this be A, I can move to the left and right of that point and move along the curve toward an x value of a, and the y coordinate I will approach will be the same as the y coordinate assigned to a. So what this means for you analytically is that now, provided the original function given to you, or the original expression is a polynomial or a rational, and this is also a variation on that because we're taking a root of a polynomial, and this is another polynomial, then that direct substitution is going to work, which means I can evaluate the output of the function if I just plug negative 2 in, and that will be the same as the limit of the function. So I could do 3 times negative 2 to the 4th plus 2 times negative 2 squared minus a negative 2 plus a 1. I'll end up with 16 times 3, which is 48, plus a 8 plus a 2 plus a 1. So it looks like we've got 56 plus 3 is a 59. Same thing here. As long as 2 is in the domain and it does not cause us to divide by 0, we can simply plug it in. So if I plug in a 2 here, and I plug in 2's on the bottom, I will have a 9 on top, and it's an 8 plus a 12 is a 20, minus 4 gives me a 16. 
for this one I have a square root. I want to make sure that I'm in the domain. So if I plug 4 in, I will get a 16 minus a 4 squared, which will give me the square root of 0, which is in the domain, so I end up with 0. And the final one, I'll plug in a negative 1. If I complete this, I'll have a 1 plus a 1 is a 2 cubed is an 8. If I plug in a negative 1 here, I'll have a 2 to the 5th is a 32. Multiply that out, I get 256. Now what I'd like you to do is attempt these notes web exam problems in your notes. Don't do them on the web exam online yet, just do them in here, see if you can, if you're comfortable with the problems, and then explain in words why finding a limit using direct substitution on a continuous function will work.